Good evening and welcome to Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. I am Sally Messner, the Director of Worship and Music here. We are so glad that you are with us tonight to experience this varied and rich program, A Thousand Tongues. Thank you for coming and please join me in welcoming Artistic Director Paolo De Bucque. everybody. Um, wonderful to see you all, and it's wonderful to be here at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. This concert grew out of uh, an a AAPI heritage acknowledgement at my church, Good Samaritan UMC, and it started very small. I asked a few friends of mine to come in and share music and memories that reflected on their experiences as people of Asian, American, of, of Asian and Pacific Islander descent. Uh, and it grew last year into a collaborative concert that we shared with the congregation and with the choir. And we never thought that we would get to do it again. And so, thanks to PSGM, the Philippine Study Group of Minnesota, we are just thrilled to be here and thrilled to be sharing this music and these reflections with you once again. So, I'm just going to get out of the way and allow these artists to take it over. Thank you all.
Our family celebrations and holidays were always very fun, very loud, often chaotic, and always very Filipino. Plentiful food, cultural traditions, mahjong games, music, and the ubiquitous program. These programs were the opportunity for my parents and those of my parents' generation to show what their children's performing talents were. Some of my cousins would sing, others would dance, and a few played an instrument. It was here that I had my first introduction to traditional Filipino song and dance. I usually, uh, actually always, I was at the piano, playing some solo pieces, but usually leading sing-alongs of all kinds of music. That first song, Pato Sa Buhangin, translated as Pebble in the Sand, became a popular request from my relatives. It was a love song from a movie, and it became the theme to some of my relatives' anniversaries. Since I was always at the piano for these party programs, relatives and friends started bringing me Filipino sheet music as gifts. They knew I enjoyed playing music that was new to me, and I loved learning about my culture through these songs. Many of the pieces I received were kundiman, a traditional Filipino love song characterized by a smooth flowing gentle rhythm with dramatic intervals. I was mostly drawn to these dramatic intervals that tug at your heart, transport you to another time, and make you feel like you're floating in space, looking at the world from above. Thank you. 
When I was 10, my family moved across the country to New Jersey, where my mom had two siblings and their families, and I learned I had lots of cousins. <laughs> Growing up in a Catholic family meant celebrating sacramental moments as a family and community. Baptisms, first communions, confirmations, weddings, and funerals were all milestones to be celebrated together. Sometimes these gatherings included sleeping over at a cousin's house, which always included lots of late night giggling in the bunk beds, and even contests, this is true, to see who could pray the longest before, before falling asleep. One of those nighttime prayers was, of course, Hail Mary, or Ave Maria in Latin, a prayer of praise for and petition to Mary, the mother of God. The first song version of the Ave Maria I heard as a kid was on a Christmas record I would play on our family's enormous credenza-sized hi-fi stereo. It was the famous Schubert setting sung by the great Leontine Price. As an adult, I fell in love with this beautiful setting by Ryan Kayab Yab. <laughs> What greater, more complicated, more all-consuming human emotion is there? Growing up Filipino-American to my family meant achieving high academic success while seamlessly assimilating into American culture but honoring our Filipino traditions. Weddings are the perfect opportunity and the celebrations to honor our Filipino traditions through both ritual and music. Minamahal Kita, or I Love You, is a song I was often asked to play for family weddings with its lilting melody and lyric that says, you are the true and only reason for my happiness. It's a perfect choice to include on a perfect day. Na 
18 years, I served as the director of contemporary and world music at the Basilica of St. Mary, just up the road on Hennepin Avenue. I had the great pleasure and honor of working with extremely talented, creative, dedicated, and visionary colleagues. One of the hallmarks of the Basilica is its inspiring and beautiful liturgies, especially those services during Holy Week, the most sacred of weeks leading up to Easter. On Holy Thursday, we, co we commemorate the Last Supper of Jesus Christ with his disciples. Part of that commemoration includes the ritual of the washing of the feet. Usually the priest will wash the feet of 12 people, the 12 people symbolizing the 12 disciples. At the Basilica, the ritual of the feet washing is, is expanded. After the priest washes the feet of 12 people, those 12 people are then invited to wash the feet of another 12 people. Those 12 people are invited to, in to wash the feet of the next 12, and so on, and so on. After each person has his or her feet washed, the two people engaged in this selfless act of caring for another seal the act with an embrace. As you can imagine, this expanded ritual ends up taking some time. And so to accompany this beautiful ritual of the feet washing, the choirs provided music. The text for the music that usually tra uh, traditionally accompanies this ritual is the mandatum, love one another as I have loved you. That word mandatum is the source of the other name given to Holy Thursday, Maundy Thursday. My friend Jose Uriarte introduced this next piece of music to me 
not long after I moved to Minnesota. It was sung by one beautiful tenor voice accompanied only by piano. I immediately fell in love with the lush and harmony and melody. Then when I read the English translation as, I will never forget you. I will never stop protecting you. Forever etched is your name in the palm of my hand. I knew I knew this would be a, a perfect piece of music, not only to accompany this ritual, but as a symbol of unconditional love. Not only the unconditional love God provides each one of us, but that which I received from my parents. I knew this was the perfect gift to be sung at my father's memorial service. Hindi kita malilimutan. I will never forget you.
Mahmoud Masaji Nishibun was born and raised in Hawaii. Born to an avid gardener, it's only natural. My dad had grandmother's green <coughs> thumb. While I grew up in the bluegrass country of Kentucky, my father ensured that his children would enjoy the same verdant beauty that he did as a boy. I remember spring walks with my dad discussing the various botanicals on the grounds. The western peaches needed to be thinned after petal fall to encourage better growth on those that remained. The ones that remained grew bigger than my fists and were my favorite toppings for vanilla ice cream on the front porch. Sundays, or any time we had summer guests, was a good time to go to the strawberry patch in the northeast and pick fruit, the best of which never actually made it indoors to the guests. <laughs> the best part for him was the cherry trees, though. To the east, he had planted two cultivars, Estella and Bing. We would walk by the cherry trees every spring with their charming, delicate white flowers. And I would hear how Bing cherries are wonderful. With Estella on the grounds, a universal pollinator, this is how the Bing bears fruit. And every year, without fail, the Bing bore squat. <laughs> Nothing, not a zilch. As a child, the cherry trees were an absolute bummer. The peach tree knew what to do. Strawberries, every summer. What the heck, cherries? As an adult, I look back and suspect that my father enjoyed the trees simply for their blossoms. That fleeting time when our trees to the east were full of delicate white flowers that he would show to his son, sharing the promise of sweet days ahead. Weiß lasst uns bedeuten, was ist traurig While my father was happy to assimilate into the southern culture of Kentucky, my mother was not. My father was a soldier when he met my mother, Gabriela in Hetzpanhois, while stationed in Stuttgart, Germany. When they moved back to the United States, my mother brought her culture with her, her food, her music, and her language. 
As is the case with many immigrants, she delighted in sharing her culture with her children. She loved cooking traditional dishes like rulade, mit rotkohl, und semmelknödel, uh, a mouth-watering stuffed and braised round roast with tender red cabbage and bread dumplings that were light as air. Her eyes would light up when she helped me with my first Brahms and Schumann songs, and she loved speaking in her native tongue with her children. One day, my brothers came home from school and told my mother they did not want to speak German anymore. They were in middle school, and they were getting bullied for speaking in a foreign language. So my mother stopped. As proud as she was to be German, she didn't want her culture to make life harder for her children. A younger version of me used to get annoyed by this, mad at the bullies for being so close-minded, annoyed at my brothers for their thoughtlessness, and disappointed at my mother for quitting. But as an adult, I look back at this with more understanding and see opportunities in my own life with my own son. I can teach him that we should celebrate differences rather than pick on them. The culture that families bring are meaningful and have value, and that I'll be there when he's ready for his first Brahms or Schumann. Masaji Nishiban was born a little over eight months ago, 
And don't worry, I have a slew of photos on my phone in case you're interested, Pope Show. <laughs> He's got his mother's smile and long fingers to go along my complexion and eyes. Ollie is a champion eater, which is wonderfully promising given the culinary diversity in our house. And as hoped, he's taken quite well to a variety of musical genres, from the polyphony of William Byrd to the string partitas of J.S. Bach, from the smooth vocal stylings of Chet Baker to the nostalgia and lightning speed of bluegrass. As a Kentucky native, I can go on and on about bluegrass. And if you're unlucky enough to get caught in that conversation, a quick Midwestern whelp will let you go. <laughs> but it speaks to me in many ways. The mandolin, the guitar, the banjo, they make me think of home, the good and the bad. And they remind me of where I come from. When Paolo first asked me if I would be interested in taking part of A Thousand Tongues, I mentioned to a friend of mine and I'm not sure if I should. What do I have to say in a concert highlighting the AAPI experience? My story isn't one that stems from being deeply rooted in Japanese culture. My story is a southern one in which I simply am Japanese. He shrugged and said, we contain multitudes. So here we are. Enjoy some mandolin, y'all. So much for hearing my story and uh, I have one last song that I'm hoping my uh, fellow singers would join me on. Um, keeping in that Appalachian tune we have a wonderful work by a local composer Chris Foss uh, named Fiddle Tune. Uh, it's based on a tune called Flop Eared Mule. He didn't like that as a title so he changed it. Uh, so we hope you enjoy Fiddle Tune before I next one. Yeah. 
This piece by Amy Beach is titled Golden Gates, the one you just heard. And there is a bit of a parallel that speaks to me being a Chinese American. I think of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. I think about the many people who immigrated to the United States via the West Coast and Angel Island, which can be seen from the bridge and vice versa. I also think about what that means to as is set in the piece to idealize a golden gate, the gleam of the West, and what kind of promise that holds for people potentially. And a gate can be both a barrier or it can be an open door. So I, I think to myself, or I ask myself, how does an immigrant cross that gate to the West? And if they make it there to that land of the blessed, what do they find the Golden Gate Bridge, a symbol of America and the American dream? Is it a barrier? Is it an open door? Is it a bridge? Like many second generation ABCs or American born Chinese, I went to Chinese language school once a week, didn't really do my homework. Um, but um, looking back, I count myself lucky that my parents really provided for, in other words, paid for a lot, a lot of, of extracurricular activities. activities. I went to, I went to Chinese, Chinese school, school, I took piano, piano lessons, and my parents, and my parents also, also sent me to me dance class, class. And, specifically, and specifically I was learning, I was learning classical, classical Chinese, Chinese dance. dance. And I, I, I had, had so, so much fun, fun with it, it. sometimes, sometimes I, I, the, the hand gestures, gestures the, the, the footwork. The footwork. Um, and, and, and the, and the, the smiling, smiling and, and prop, prop work, work and things like that, that was, was so much fun. fun. And, and um, I, can I can remember when I was seven or eight, or eight years old, my mother, my mother was, conducting was conducting a national, national honor, honor choir, choir in Chicago. Chicago. And, the choir, and the choir was performing, was performing an arrangement of flower drum, drum song, song, which you're about which to hear in a moment. And I danced to it. The costumes, I mean, that's got to be fun, right? And I cartwheeled on stage from backstage. I'm wearing contact lenses now. I did not then. And I was like blindly, blindly cartwheeling across the stage. stage. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't I fall didn't off the stage. stage. And, I like, and I like to think, think that's, that's a metaphor, metaphor for my for life. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a just few a props, props here. here. Um, uh, a little, a little flower, flower drum here, here on my hip, hip and a gong. gong. So, so uh, this uh, is just a fun, silly little song that you can imagine being sung, being sung in a, in a busker, busker kind, kind of fashion. fashion. Here we go. Here we go. So this next piece is something different. <laughs> and it comes from Germany, which is a place that I lived for a year, followed by two years in Austria. And that was a time in my life, living thousands of miles from home, where I really could more closely appreciate the journey that my own parents took, leaving their homes thousands of miles away and having to find their own way in a new language, a new country, new social customs. And at that time, if my mother was sad, 
like really, really sad, she'd have to shell out a lot of money for that long distance phone call for grandma to listen to her cry. And for me, second generation, pretty privileged in comparison, I could just call her on FaceTime anytime I wanted. But it, nonetheless, it was a difficult time of my life in terms of being separate, separated from my people. It also gave me an appreciation for diversity, something that made me more aware too of that part of my Americanness that I really valued. So for example, Germans are stereotypically known to be rule followers. Okay, stereotypes, yes, yes, that's not always true. But in this particular case, I jaywalked. It was the evening, there wasn't really a lot of traffic, it was a small neighborhood road, no cars going anywhere, and there happened to be another pedestrian on the other side of the road who saw me, and she said to me, das ist nicht erlaubt in Deutschland. <laughs> that is not allowed in Germany. But you know, she could have also just said, that's not allowed. Right? She made an assumption about me. I hadn't said a word to her. But you know, we, we all eventually, hopefully, come into conversation with other people. We continue to learn and exp new experiences. And I loved my time abroad. Highly recommend. Go study abroad. All of you students, go. Go do it. OK, anyway, this is Strauss Morgan.
listening to K-pop. Uh, ooh, okay. <laughs> I also love singing R&B, folk. Give me all the Bach melismas you can throw at me. I want them. But my mom, who's a classically trained musician, I should say she didn't let me actually listen to generic rock and roll music out loud, but I was allowed to listen to jazz greats like Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan. And so I think a lot of that tradition, that musical tradition has, has made its way into my own music making. I have memories of watching my mom sing and play the piano and in particular spirituals such as Give Me Jesus. And this is the, the, the spiritual we sang for her mother's funeral, my grandmother's funeral in 2016, Waipo. Um, quick little story about my grandma then. Um, okay, do we have time? Of course we have time, okay. <laughs> I don't even know why I asked. Okay, so grandma is a snake. You know, the Chinese zodiac, the 12 animals. You, yeah, okay, so I'm a snake too. And so is my other grandma, incidentally. Okay, so always grandma was a snake. And therefore you can calculate how old she was, right? What year she was born. She was 97 years old, 98 years old, 99 years old. But, but she turned 100 earlier than we thought she would. She said, I'm a dragon, y'all. No, no, Grandma, you're, I'm a dragon. I have always been a dragon. So we all celebrated. She was the matriarch of the family, and we celebrated her 100th birthday. All the cousins, all the aunts and uncles, one cousin coming from Tokyo, me from Austria, to celebrate Grandma's 100th birthday. <laughs> what a lady.
I currently live in a town called Decorah, Decorah, Iowa, where I teach at Luther College. And Decorah has a population of about seven to 8,000 people, where about 1.64% of those people are Asian. I mentioned all those cousins and aunts and uncles, right? And now they have spawned children. And I did a little math. And if that side of the family were to come visit me, we would increase the total Asian population by almost half a percentile. I say that to give a little context of this Asian, Asian American, American experience that I have been seeing for the past few years while teaching at Luther. I love my students. Decora is gorgeous. And still, I am learning what it's like to have to, at times, explain myself maybe more frequently than I'm used to. And there really is a value in a space like this, in a community like this, where I can exist and where I can be welcomed and included without any assumptions or with minimal assumptions. And so we, we all have something to do as a part of that, right? Me too, me too. I want to listen to Filipino stories. I want to listen to Vietnamese stories, Hmong stories, Nigerian stories, Venezuelan stories. I want to learn so much so that we can dream, really dream.
Hello. <laughs> um, Jeremy is, has some lingering phlegm and coughing from a cold, so we will be his speaking voice in order for him to pace himself while he's singing. For Jeremy's section of the program, it is entitled, My First Blink. Every piece that he is singing this evening has been formative to him, not just as a musician, but also as a person. The song you just heard, Widmung, was a formative song for him as a young student at DePauw University. It was there that he fell in love with art song and would serve as a jumpstart to his entire musical career, largely because of the people that he would end up meeting. One of those people was a tenor named Joe, who would end up becoming a member of Contus and introducing him to the ensemble. His very first voice teacher encouraged him to audition for the Oregon Bach Festival and the JSB Ensemble in Stuttgart, Germany, where he met a number of incredible musicians like Kathy Romy from the U, Paul Schultz, one of his current Contus colleagues, and Adriana Tam, <laughs> with whom he is sharing the stage tonight. <laughs> I'm such a ham. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> for the next song, he would like to go further back to his childhood. The Japanese folk song, Amabe no Uta, stir stirs up powerful memories. As he sings, he can envision so clearly sinking into his grandparents' beige, faintly patterned 80s style sofa while his grandfather sat beside him playing cassette tapes of his Sanshin ensemble with various tools strewn about as he repaired his instruments.
pursuing his undergraduate degree at DePaul University was an eye-opening experience. Growing up in Hawaii certainly came with a number of personal challenges, but one thing that Jeremy never really had to question was his ethnic identity. Because Hawaii boasts such a mix of ethnicities, they never grew up knowing the label Asian American. His friends and he would rattle off their ethnicities with pride. Jeremy is Okinawan Chinese. His friend Andrew is Hawaiian Filipino Chinese. His friend Pookela is Hawaiian Filipino German English Chinese Spanish. His friend Karen is Filipino Chinese Spanish Icelandic Norwegian Welsh and Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> this would not end up being the case in rural Indiana, and for the first time, Jeremy had to grapple with the fact that he was for the first time in his life, living as a minority. In his junior year at DePauw, Jeremy had a chance to work with a visiting voice professor who is of Japanese descent. He was so happy to see a face that looked like his that he kind of stalked her performer's bio and discovered that she is a champion of living female composer Makiko Kinoshita. This was his introduction to Japanese art song and would jumpstart a long-standing love of the genre. The song, At One Time, At One Day, a, a programmatic change, is a nostalgic yet hopeful look toward autumn, saying, haven't you had such a time, even a dead leaf sadly falling from a treetop, somehow seems to be dancing with joy.
The last two pieces we'll sing tonight are near and dear to Jeremy's heart. Growing up singing in the Hawaii Youth Opera Chorus, it was pretty common to sing upwards of 10 languages every year. Jeremy thinks the most they counted was 14. But the ensemble had deep roots in perpetuating and deepening all of their connection to the music in Hawaii. Excuse me, to the music of Hawaii. This piece by Queen Liliuokalani was written during her eight-month imprisonment in her own royal palace during the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. One of her few luxuries in this time period was receiving daily bouquets of flowers slyly wrapped in newspaper so that she could know what was going on in her own kingdom. One day, she recognized flowers that came from her own garden estate, Pao Kalani, and was so inspired that she wrote the following song, Kuupua i Pao Kalani. As we transition to our last number of the piece, I want to say a brief thank you to everybody who made this possible. Um, first off, Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church and Sally Messner for being a wonderful host for us. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jonathan Orwig, making everything happen back there. And all the singers in the choir, 
and especially all the people, donors, supporters of PSGM, the Philippine Study Group of Minnesota. Uh, PSGM is an organization de dedicated to social justice and human rights accountability in the Philippines and the US that I've been privileged to be around for as long as I can remember. And um, collaborating with them on this project has just been such a gift. So thank you all for being here. Um, we have one more song for you.
thank you all. I said we had one more song, and I was lying. Um, if you'll humor us, um, the Philippine Study Group of Minnesota was founded over 40 years ago to call attention to the human rights abuses perpetrated by the Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship. Many of its founding and continuing members were political refugees and exiles who spoke out and marched against his regime. That spirit of resistance and justice that animated those activities powers PSGM to this day. In honor of and in gratitude for their work, we offer to you the song Bayan Ko, or My Country, an old patriotic song that became the unofficial anthem of protest against tyranny. The song likens the Philippines to a bird set free and pleads for the land's return to its rightful people. To this day, the song carries a powerful message for all those who have fought and continue to fight injustice in the Philippines. If you know the song, we invite you to sing or hum along. <laughs> 